Hallelujah. Above the fireplace in our home, we have a picture that is a depiction of Ruth, and it's a young woman uh, with a bundle of sheaves from a harvest in a field, uh, and it just shines uh, with the sunlight on the field, but we, we had it for quite a long time, and in the process of updating it, got a new frame for that picture. And it's amazing what getting a new frame for something that you thought was a great picture, and a new frame so enhanced the beauty of it that this picture that was really nice became awe-inspiring. And the only difference was the frame. But how we frame things makes a difference in how we see them, in how we understand them. And really, we want to talk about reframing, OK? And in the midst of God pouring out his spirit, it seems so insignificant. But let's allow God to speak to us. Uh, we've been studying Beniah. Uh, Benaiah, three different occasions, he fought Moab's two mightiest men. On another time, he chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day and killed it. And then he fought a huge Egyptian that had much better weaponry than him. But in all three cases, he defeated the enemy. And, and it's interesting how what must have been a trial and a difficulty for Benaiah turned into a means of advancement. Word must have gotten to David and said, David, one of your mighty men is fearless. One of your mighty men is not afraid to lay down their lives, not afraid to take on the most difficult of battles. This is someone to keep an eye on. At the end of the scriptures that we've been reading every service, it says of Benaiah, that David put him in charge of his bodyguard. And you can picture someone like David who needs a bodyguard to protect him, to watch over him, to go before him. And who does he choose but someone willing to take on a lion, someone willing to fight the strongest of enemies and not back down in any way. And so what would have seemed to Benaiah at, at first light to have been an incredible challenge and a problem. And, and sometimes we have this ideal picture of scripture and these battles that isn't real. My picture of Benaiah coming out of these three experiences were a couple broken bones, some slashes from the lion, bruises and welts and bleeding all over. If you've got a picture that he took all three fights and he came out dressed for seminar, you have lost your mind, okay? He came out having gone through a battle and suffered, but what seemed terrible, what seemed like a problem and a trial was a means of promotion. And I have no doubt that years later, Benaiah continued to progress. It says in 1 Kings that 1.8, you don't have to turn to it, but when Adonijah tried to take over the kingdom from David, when he tried to self-promote himself to replace his father as king, it says that Benaiah was one of those that remained loyal to King David. And so in addition to being fearless, in addition to willing to risk his life, he was a loyal man to the king. And what that did was open the door that when Solomon became king, all of a sudden Benaiah was the one who executed judgment on Adonijah. He was the one who slayed Joab when Joab turned against the king. And he was appointed commander of the army of Israel, the number one spot. For a, for a fighting man, for a soldier. I can picture sitting down with his grandkids and saying, you know, they were three of the hardest days of my life. And I framed them a certain way, like, oh, if I don't ever see a lion the rest of my life, I'll be good. 
but I have to reframe them now as the means to promotion. I have to reframe them now as the means that God used to cause me to fulfill everything he had for my life. And we have to do that sometimes. We can look at problems as difficulties, trials, and conveniences, but as we go through them the right way, and I hope we can see that tonight, those problems end up getting reframed as opportunities for you and I to grow, as opportunities for you and I to change, opportunities for you and I to be the men and women God has called us to be. Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7. It says, No one from the east or west from the, can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down and exalts and promotes another. The one who promoted Benaiah was the Lord as he saw his faithfulness, loyalty, and willingness to lay down his life. One person said, Who you become is not determined by your circumstances, but rather the outcome of your life is determined by how you respond to those circumstances. How do we handle things? There's a young lady back home. Her name is Shelly. Excuse me while I get a drink here. Shelly has battled stage four colon cancer for two or three years. And you would think that she has two small children. Uh, some of the battles of being constantly in and out of the hospital, constantly going through one treatment after another, you would think that it would drag anyone down and sap them of their faith and of strength. And it's almost embarrassing when the little problems that we face in life. Traffic was too bad today. I had to wait in line too long at Robinson's, whatever the little things are. And then you see someone with stage four cancer and they are constantly giving glory to God. They are constantly honoring God. And what I see in Shelley is honoring God for every day that he grants her, giving glory to God for the grace to get through, knowing that he's there for her. And it's an amazing thing to see what she has gone through and how she has honored God with it. <coughs> you very easily could have been discouraged. You could have easily, she could have easily said, Lord, I followed you my whole life. Lord, I've been faithful to you. She posted yesterday as I was preparing this message, Psalm 112 in verse 7. And she posted a scripture. She confidently asked the Lord to take care of her. You know, she chased down her own lion, and it was stage four cancer. She fought her own Moabite, and I know there's others here who have gone through things. As she went through chemo and other treatments, she fought off the enemy saying, if God really loved you, he wouldn't let you go through that. But we have to get a right perspective on the problems we face, on the battles we face, on the challenges we go through. We wouldn't wish it on anybody, but it's amazing to see a young lady with two small kids who has grown in the stature of Christ through the means of stage four cancer and has become stronger on the inside, who has honored God with a greater passion, but through the framework of great difficulty. Genesis 15, 1 through 5. And I know I say it a lot that it's one of my favorite scriptures and I have a lot of favorite scriptures. But in Genesis, and I hope you do too, Genesis 15, when God was speaking to Abraham, if you want to find it in your Bibles and, and follow along, Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. And it says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless 
and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, you've given me no children, so, so a servant in my household will be my heir. The word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then verse 5, he said, Abram, you can't understand this. We're inside your tent. All you can see is the top of the tent. And I love this next part. Took him by the hand, and it says he took him outside. He took him outside where instead of seeing a seven-foot-high tent, Abram could look to the stars. He could see the, the magnitude of stars in the sky. And God said, now you've got a perspective of how great I am. Sometimes our perspective of what God can do in our lives is too small. And God's got to reframe it. He's got to take us outside. He's got to reframe our problems so that we see them as they are the means for God to grow us. We have to reframe like a picture the things that God uses in our life to change us. We have to look at problems in life, circumstances, through the frame of Scripture. And I tried to give some examples because when I started to think of that word reframing, I thought of how Jesus reframed the attitudes of the people who followed him. Take, for example, the Samaritans. The Samaritans were despised. They were looked down on. They were a mixed breed of people with a false religion. The Jews would not even speak to them. That's why in John 4, they were shocked to find Jesus talking to the woman at the well. But Jesus went out of his way to reframe the picture that people had of the Samaritans. When they asked him about loving your neighbor, he told a story. And he didn't tell a story about a Jew who cared about others and gave themselves. But he, he talked about a priest who walked by and a Levite who walked by. And then who helped out this person that had been beaten and robbed? It was a Samaritan that the Jews did not value. And the Lord said to his disciples, I'm going to reframe how you see these people, that they have taught you to despise them. I'm going to reframe how you look at these people that you look down on, maybe because they beg on the street, maybe because they don't have jobs, maybe because they cheat the system, whatever it might be. And then he told a parable of 10 lepers who were healed, as if he hadn't finished reframing. He'd, he'd gotten two of the sides done. And he said there were 10 lepers that were healed, and they began to go away. We know the story. Only one turned around, <laughs> and it wasn't someone from the tribe of Judah. It wasn't someone from the tribe of Issachar. He said it was a foreigner. It was a Samaritan who you looked down on, who was the only one who gave thanks. Jesus is in the business of reframing how you and I look at people. And one, I started to take some notes sitting on the front row just before service. One thing revival will do is it will cause us to reframe our attitudes and our actions in everything that we do. If we want to talk about reframing, we can have a wonderful little lesson about Benaiah. But if you see revival coming in, all of a sudden, God will change the way we speak, because the dove is the most sensitive of birds. At a harsh sound, the dove flies. If all of a sudden our words get harsh, we jeopardize revival. All of a sudden we start to criticize someone and find fault, we jeopardize revival. If you want to reframe the behavior, revival will cause it to happen. We'll look at it in a second. But Jesus re reframed how we look at other people through the lens of Scripture. When you do that, when you do it as Jesus did it, you begin to see everyone as invaluable and irreplaceable. You begin to love people when they least deserve it and least expect it. And we know the Scriptures. We could do this all night. Jesus reframed how they looked at the sinful woman who came and anointed him. 
They criticized and said, oh, if he were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. But Jesus turned it around and said, oh, no, oh, no, you didn't give me any water to wash my feet. She's wiping them with her tears. You didn't anoint my head with oil. She has anointed me, and on and on. so sure about yourself. And we look down on ourselves. That's why there's so much insecurity in the world around us. That's why there's so many identity issues. And we have to begin to reframe ourselves through the lens of Scripture. I, I looked at 1 Timothy 4.12 and it's interesting what Paul said to Timothy. Don't let anyone look down on you. In other words, Timothy, this is up to you. You've got to see yourself in the light of who I made you to be. Don't let them look down on you. Don't let them criticize what you are saying and how you're saying it and how you're acting as a young pastor. Don't let anyone despise you for your youth. You can control it in your mind. I can picture Paul in a private conversation trying to get Timothy to reframe who he was saying, Timothy, you are called of God. Timothy. <laughs> the real role. <laughs> are you sure? I really like this one. <laughs> okay, hold on. I got to rewind. Paul reframing Timothy. I can see him quoting Psalm 139. Timothy, don't let them look down on you. Don't listen to their critical words. And sometimes you have to reframe yourself so that you see yourself the way God sees you. As fearfully and wonderfully made, as perfectly created, you are created exactly the way God wanted you to be. God didn't make a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. He created us all different. He gave us all as we heard the, the prophecy. We've all received different gifts though, so the body of Christ can be complete. But, but if you need to reframe yourself, get it over with tonight. When we worship in closing, get it over with tonight. See yourself as God sees you, as perfectly made, as a creature created to give honor and glory to him, not as the world's done it. If a Timothy has to be corrected to where he says, don't let anyone despise you, we also need to look at life through the, the frame of Scripture. When we do, the circumstances of our lives start to look remarkably different. So often when the, the frame doesn't include eternity, we get caught up in the here and now, and the frame that we're looking at this picture of life through doesn't quite do it justice. We need an eternal perspective. God is working in our lives in a way that we will follow him and honor him for all eternity. He's not worried about this week as much as we are. He's not worried about what's for dinner tomorrow night as much as we are. He's worried about a thousand years from now, like we sing about. And sometimes the frame that we put around it isn't quite the right one. Beniah came over the hill and saw two Moabites. One of them had two sacks of stolen mangoes. The other one had two sacks of stolen papayas. And Beniah said, that is enough. This was the food these people were depending on. ZMI students are going to starve for the next three months. I've got to fight this battle. And all of a sudden, those mangoes and papayas were the reason to take on Moab and entire countries two mightiest warriors. He found a cause. 
Then a lion flew by him at 35 miles an hour with one of the ZMI dogs in its mouth. And Benaiah said, oh, no. I will not be back in 2024. <laughs> I still remember. We'll get back to being serious in a second. I still remember the one year that I, de I decided to tell a Manny Pacquiao joke. And um, you can laugh, don't worry. But anyhow, he had gotten knocked down in a fight, and I was talking about falling down. And I said something about falling down like Manny Pacquiao. There was dead silence. Like, you could have heard a pin drop. And all we got from the front row, Mrs. Holmes tried to shake her head no in the slowest possible manner so no one saw it. And she just went, <laughs> I, I will never forget that day. And it was like, OK, I love Manny Pacquiao. Let's go on. <laughs> I reframed that joke as throw in garbage. <laughs> Sometimes we have to reframe problems, and we have to reframe them with a frame that says, I needed that. I don't know if you can ever remember times when you've just messed up and you've broken and cried and God has just hammered on you, but you came out feeling so refreshed. God gives us through prob problems opportunities to change and opportunities to grow. He gives us opportunities to reevaluate our priorities, but he does it through problems. He does it through difficulties. He does it through challenges, opportunities to see ourselves as we really are. And we may not like the scripture, but in James 1, verses 1 to 4, James is the, gives us the famous count it all joy scripture. James 1 and verse 2. Count it all joy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. In other words, we go through difficulties. We go through trials. And he said, listen, don't frame it as God must not love me. Frame it as God's trying to produce something. It might be perseverance in one person. It might be gratitude in another. It doesn't have to be the same. But God uses these things to change us and to grow us. I think we can all think of trials in our lives, multiple trials that God used to better us, that God used to grow us as men and women. In Matthew 5.21, Jesus reframed values. Jesus took a value that said, you shall not murder. And he threw out that frame and he said, oh no, I don't want you getting angry with others. He, he reframed totally how we look at the way we treat other people. He reframed the oaths that we give, the way that we treat our enemies. He reframed the outward religion and being satisfied with it. Entitlement and the 11th hour workers were paid the same and on and on. Jesus reframed attitudes. He's in that business. Revival will reframe values and attitudes. In Matthew 4, and I want to repeat this. In Matthew 4, when Jesus went to be baptized by John the Baptist, in verses... 16 and 17. I'm sure it's the wrong scripture. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. And it begins and it says this, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water at that moment Heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son whom I loved. With him I am well pleased. 
The, the dove is the most sensitive of birds. Just a sharp noise and the dove will flee. A harsh word, a critical word, division and a lack of unity in the church, taking the glory for ourselves in any way, showing pride at what God begins to do as he pours out his spirit. We can almost count on the fact the dove will fly. I hope that's not a sacrilegious, but the dove will fly if there are things going on where the Holy Spirit's presence doesn't fit it. Revival will reframe our values, our treatment of others. Our hearts will be enlarged in revival. 1 Kings 4 and verse 29. Our hearts will be enlarged for people that, that are so different from us, from people that we've never associated with. Solomon received largeness of heart. God will do that in revival. Waiting on the Lord for his timetable. No one being seen as below us. No one above another person. Everyone being a servant. Everyone involved in the harvest. Revival will reframe our values in a way that everyday church life will not. Revival, lastly, before we go on, will reframe our expectations. We will believe God for greater things. We will trust God and have faith to see our desires fulfilled, to see him build his church, to see him draw in the lost and bring the backslider back. We need to look at life through the lens of Scripture. We also need to go to the next page in the notes. Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. Jesus tried to reframe how his disciples would look at difficulty and persecution. And some of these verses are on our list of least favorites. But he said in verse 11, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven." We tend to see the short term. How could they say that about me? How could they say that? It's just not true. In the short term, we look at it and we resent it. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Long term frame, long term way of looking at it. God will reward you because you're persecuted for my sake. What situations are you and I currently facing today that need to be reframed from God's perspective, and pray, Lord, use this to grow me. Use this to make me a better man or a better woman. Use this, O oh Lord, to give me a heart like David's that is after you, seeking you, O oh God. We don't like to hear it, but God cares more about the long-term potential we have than our short-term gains. God cares about the long-term. One person said very simply, no adversity equals no opportunity. No adversity equals no growth. No problems and difficulties equals no change. Paul Bilheimer wrote a book that is still one of my favorites. It's an older one, and it was entitled, Don't Waste Your Sorrows. Don't waste your sorrows. Be encouraged that God doesn't waste anything that we go through. God doesn't waste the difficulties that we pass through. He uses them to get us prepared for where he's taking us. We know Psalm 84 in verse 6. Blessed are those as they pass through the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping, the place where we are broken and weep. They make it a pool for others to drink from for others to be refreshed from. The experience they gain becomes a blessing to other people. Blessed are those. They go through difficulty, but not one bit of it is wasted. We don't want to waste our suffering. We don't want to waste our failures. We don't want to waste our disappointments. The, even the cancer, like I've watched Shelley go through terrible, terrible things but she's not wasting it. 
she's not wasting it. We can waste our things. We can bury some of our experiences. God wants to, to recycle those things for his purposes. He wants to recycle. He wants to frame them as an opportunity to help somebody else going through the same thing. At the end of our lives, we'll thank God for the lions. We'll thank him for the Moabites. We'll thank him for the Egyptians. We'll thank him for the false accusations like Joseph went through. We'll thank, you. We'll thank him for the years like David on the run from Saul when he deserved none of it and he had been faithful to Saul. We will see that past problems prepared us for future opportunities. And there are things we've all gone through that we look back and while we went through them, they were the worst days of our lives and we reframe them 10 years later as, wow, did that help me? Wow, that changed me. Wow, I was never the same. God worked in my life. Sometimes we pray and I don't know what your prayer life looks like, but sometimes a lot of our prayer life is problem avoidance. Lord, get me out of this. Lord, take this away. Lord, can you solve this problem? And ideally, could you do it tonight? You know, we pray to get out of things that God has put in our, in our lives for a purpose, to change us and to help us. As we see the fruit of Benaiah's risk-taking, that he went from from the three fights that we've talked about. He went from there to being a bodyguard for King David, the, the greatest of kings, to being the commander of the army. We see the fruit of risk-taking, the fruit of fear-facing, the fruit of seizing the opportunities that go before us. And instead of praying for God to take things away, Maybe we should just pray and say, Lord, strengthen me to get through this. Viktor Frankl wrote a book. He was a Holocaust survivor. He wrote a book entitled Man's Search for Meaning. And it talks about everything that was taken away from him when he went into the German concentration camp. The humiliation of being stripped of absolutely everything. And he had a statement that is very famous. I'm sure we've heard it. But he said, everything can be taken from a man or woman. But one thing, the last of human freedoms, the freedom to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. We can go through anything, but we get to choose how we respond to it. We get to choose if we complain or if we trust and look to God for help reframing problems as growth opportunities, knowing that God will reframe some of our attitudes, some of the, our priorities, some of the way we approach life. There was a professor, Vicki Medvev, Medvek, and she did a study, and it was very interesting. She studied Olympic athletes who won medals, and her conclusion was so interesting because she said that bronze medalists, third place, were happier than silver medalists, second place. Now, on the face of it, you go, no, 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 no. Second place is better than third place. That's got to be wrong. But she said what she found, those who came in second place were upset because they were close to first and did not make it, and it bothered them, and they were negative. The third place people, they were just happy to be on the podium. They were just happy to get a medal. And it seems backwards, but third place had a better perspective than second place. And so you've got a second place silver medalist with a frown on their face, and you've got a third place medalist like kindergarten kids in a program waving to grandma, happy as all get out. It's our perspective that matters. I say hallelujah. Give us a perspective that's right. In the movie The Third Man, I put this in there for Sister Holmes, you guys. 
in the movie The Third Man, 1949, before even I was born, by Orson Welles, he gave a famous speech. And he said, in Italy, for 30 years, the Borgias, they, during the Borgias' reign, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed. But they produced Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland to the north, they had brotherly love, 500 years of democracy and peace. The others produced Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and the Renaissance. The Swiss produced the cuckoo clock. <laughs> That's a plug for Italy. <laughs> Philippians 1.29. I do get lost on my messages. I'm sorry. <laughs> Philippians 1.29. Can you turn to that? We're almost at the end. Hallelujah, Jesus. Philippians 129. Paul's writing in a church that was so dear to him. In verse 29, it says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. And that word granted, it's the Greek sherizomai, and it means to grant a favor. In other words, it's somebody does something for you and you grant them a favor. And so if you read it again with the Greek version, you have been granted a favor on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him. It's an amazing thing to think of suffering as a favor. But, but the Lord looks at it as those things grow us. God's doing us a favor because it develops us, it changes us, it makes us who he wants us to be. And rather than complaining about things that come into our lives, maybe from tonight on, we start to reframe things. And we say, Lord, you know this wasn't my first choice, but use it to grow me. Use it to change me. Use me to be able to build up an inventory of compassion that will minister to other people. Use it to build up a well that other people can drink from. The circumstances you complain about become the chains that imprison you, one man said. The circumstances we complain about become the chains that imprison us. That's when we worship. That's when we focus on the goodness and greatness of our God. It helps us to reframe our problems. Problems and adversity are often a favor from the Lord and a blessing in disguise. Beniah came out of these three fights if the worship team would come. Beniah came out of these three fights with two things, a greater confidence in what God could do through him, a greater courage for the next battles to be fought, experience gained for the future. But on the other side, he came out, of, he came out with scars to remind him of what he had been through. Scars aren't always a bad thing. Scars aren't always a bad thing because they remind us of situations in our past where God was there and God showed himself faithful. I have no doubt that Benaiah had some scars from that lion. I have no doubt that when he saw them, and he's commander of the army of Israel, he's older, he's in charge of all of Israel's soldiers, an entire nation, and he sees that scar on his arm, and he said, thank you, Lord. I wouldn't be here without that scar. I wouldn't be there without the way you led me. It wasn't my choice. I never could have realized it, but Lord, thank you. Let's do some reframing.
Let's do some reframing of the things God leads us into. Let's change the frame so that we see the picture of our lives and what God is doing the way he wants us to see it. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. We're going to worship and come back and pray and see what the Lord will do. As they're getting ready and Pastor Dong is coming. I did feel such a burden today as they're getting ready. For anybody that needs to reframe how you look at yourself. Anybody who needs to reframe how you look at yourself. You've been made in the image and likeness of God. And we want to see a breakthrough tonight.